following movie, we'll take a look at the scalable performance simulation solutions available from Siemens. We'll begin with the Wizards. The Wizards are best for designers with little or no finite element analysis experience. Using the Stress Wizard, we can run a linear static analysis on a link. We'll go ahead and select the single body that we'll use for the analysis. Then we'll identify a location where we'd like to apply a load. Here we'll specify the load value. Multiple loads can be applied. We'll only specify the one. Then we'll select a constraint. Here we'd like to fix the other end of the link. Next we'll specify a material. If a material had been specified by the designer, this would be specified automatically. Then we can go ahead and solve for our results. And once the model is completed, we can then review those results. Here we're looking at the deflection predicted from the simulation. We can animate an exaggerated view of those deflections. We can also take a look at the stresses in the part. And the legend over on the left, if we move the stress wizard window, we'll be able to see what those values are. Here we'll take a look at those with our safety factor result. And this is probably going to be of most use to the designer since it shows the areas where we're predicting yielding in the part in red, where we are exceeding our factor of safety of two in yellow, and where the part is good with a factor of safety of at least two in green. So since we have an area where we're predicting yielding, we'd like to make a change to the part in order to try to make the safety factor a bit better. So to do that, we'll go back and make a change to our part using the synchronous modeling tools. And then we can re-enter the stress wizard. One of the limitations with the stress wizard is that you can't save the results of it for reuse within the stress wizard. You can save the results for reuse with one of our more advanced tools such as the design simulation package or the pre-post advanced simulation package, both of which we'll take a look at in just a moment. So here we're re-specifying our loads and our constraints. as well as our material. Go ahead and perform the simulation and review the updated results. Here we can see our deflections, stresses, and factor of safety. Now you can see that we're no longer predicting yielding with the updated design. All right, now that we've completed our stress wizard simulation, we can go ahead and create images for use in a report. And it automatically creates all of those images, and then we can review the simulation report. Here we can see our material summary, our meshes, physical properties, loads, constraints, and results. You can see our max stress deflection. Let's go ahead and make this a little bit smaller so we can see the pictures a little bit better. So there's our deflections, stress, and factor of safety. All 
All right, so here again, we'll go ahead and save as we exit the stress wizard, and we'll now be able to use this in the, the design simulation package, which we'll go into now. So with design simulation, let's go ahead and add this component into the rest of the assembly. We actually analyzed the component in the context of the assembly, so the assembly was available. Let's go ahead and hide some of the components that we're not interested in analyzing with design simulation. and just focus on this subset of the assembly. So one of the features that design simulation adds to the Strength Wizard is the ability to analyze assemblies. Assemblies that have multiple material properties. So here we've specified titanium for the one link. Everything else that is strong corn flour in color is also made out of titanium, so we'll use that color to identify all of those bodies that we'd like to specify as titanium. Now for the pins, we'll make those out of a different material. So We'll go ahead and inherit that color as medium olive and then select all the medium olive objects to assign stainless steel 310. Next, we'll go ahead and put a mesh on the rest of the assembly. Here you can see we have a lot more options in design simulation for how we want to create our 3D mesh. We have options to control the internal mesh gradation or element growth as the mesh goes from the outside of the part towards the interior. All right, here we can see we have our part meshed. Now, if there's an area where we're particularly interested in improved accuracy, we have the ability to put on mesh controls. There's a number of different methods we have to put on a mesh control. Here we'll specify a size on face, and we'll put in a finer mesh on that location. So here you can see a, a much finer mesh on that face, whereas the rest of the model is a bit coarser. All right, now that we've specified our mesh and our material properties, we'll go and specify our loads and constraints in the simulation. So here we'll create a new solution. This will be a structural linear static solution. And we'll begin by putting in some constraints. You can see we have quite a, more, uh, quite a few more constraint types available to us in design simulation. Here we'll specify a load, and we have some additional options available in design simulation for specifying loads as well. Here we'll put our arrow loads as far as drag and lift are concerned on the frames. And we'll also put on a symmetric constraint on the frames to keep them from bending under those loads and limit it to sliding only. Next, we'll define how the assembly is connected using surface-to-surface -surface gluing, and we'll use the automatic pairing algorithm to automatically select all of the pairs within the specified search distance. Here you can see it's found 31, and then we can go ahead and create our glue. Here we can make the markers a bit smaller since they're a bit large. And now we can better see exactly what parts have been connected. All right, now we're ready to solve. 
While this one's solving, since it's a bit larger, I'm going to be pausing the video, but you'll be able to see in the bottom right-hand corner of the solution monitor exactly how much time has passed. And this solution takes about 37 seconds to complete. And now we can review our results. We'll begin by looking at the displacement that results from the loads and constraints that we've defined. We can animate those displacements. You can also take a look at the stresses in the part, and we can view various components of stress since we have the full post-processing capabilities available to us in design simulation. Here we'll take a look at an average stress by averaging across the nodal stress locations. And we can also turn on our annotations to see where the max stress occurs and what it is. So here we're a little over uh, what we'd like to be for max stress for this assembly. And you can see we have a rather thin web here, which is probably the cause of giving us the high stresses in this location. So what we'll do next is go back to our model and correct the thin web location. So here the assembly is a bit complex, but I think we can get a view into where that thin web is. If we look right down the end here, and here you can see that thin web. So there's a number of ways that we can remove that thin web. We'll use uh, some of the synchronous tools in order to remove it. We'll bring that back face up to fill in that hollowed out area. All right, now one of the advantages of design simulation is that we don't have to re-specify all of our mesh material properties, loads, boundary conditions, all of that remains associatively linked to our design. And all we need to do is hit the update button to update our mesh. Here you can see our mesh is updated on the component that was modified. Here we'll go back to the simulation where we specified our loads, constraints, and connections. We'll create a new solution so we can maintain our old solution and results. And we're ready to solve. And again, I paused it, took another 37 seconds, and we're ready to take a look at our results for our updated design. And here, so we can see this a little bit better, we'll do a, a top and bottom so we can put the initial results from our original design on the top and our updated results from our updated design on the bottom. So that we can uh, take a look at both of them at the same time using the average stress plot, we'll go ahead and make sure that we're looking at the average stress for both of these views. And then we'll also tie the views together by synchronizing the top and bottom views. So if we rotate one, the other rotates as well. Now if we turn on our annotations so we can see the maximum and see what it is, you can see that we've substantially reduced the maximum stress in our assembly from our modification. We've also changed the location of that maximum stress.
All right, next we'll go into the pre-post product, which is our top-end simulation package. And here we'll add some more detail to our assembly to refine our analysis. So here to open up full functionality, we'll change from Nastran Design to NX Nastran. And we'll also turn on some more of our product assembly that we'd like to include in our analysis. So here we'll include the airfoils. And on them, we would like to create a shell mesh. Shell meshing is not something available in design simulation. But it's a great way of adding some more definition to our finite element model in a very efficient manner. So here we'll define some of the physical properties of our shell mesh in terms of the material that it's made out of. We'll select aluminum and the thickness. And it's 40 thousandths of an inch. And throughout all of the NX uh, and SimCenter dialog, you'll notice that you have unit selections available. So you can work within the units that you're comfortable. So here if we take a look at the element thickness and offset, you can see that we're thick, our thick thickness is correct, but our offset is not. So let's go ahead and correct that by specifying an offset since we were meshing on the outer surface. We'll go ahead and offset it by half the thickness, and you can see now our shell mesh is right where it needs to be. We'll create a shell mesh on the trailing airfoil face next. And for this one, we want to specify it as a laminate layup. Since it is a laminate, we need to make sure that our material, ori material orientation is consistent across our mesh. Here, if we take a look at the material, material orientation, you can see that it's not consistent across all of the elements. To do so, we'll go ahead and select a tangent curve to align our material orientations. All right, now that that looks good, we'll go ahead and specify our laminate properties. First, we'll begin by specifying a stacking recipe that states we'll be inheriting this layup from FiberSim in just a moment. We'll also specify our ply failure theory and shear stress for bonding. All right, now we're ready to import our layup from FiberSim. So all of the plies have already been specified, and now all we need to do is import those. by importing our FiberSim H5 ply data file, which specifies the plies, the orientation, the materials. And here you can see it's imported 12 plies. Here you can see our layup and the various plies. We'll go ahead and update the global layup and zones based on that import. And now we can see that ply 12 is applied to all of those faces, as is 11, but 10 and 8 are only on the leading edge of our airfoil. We can also view the laminate by selecting an element or a face, and you can see on this face there's eight plies. You can see the material, thickness, and orientation angle. Here we'll select the forward leading edge of the airfoil, and you can see there's 12 plies there.
All right, now that we've specified our laminate, we're ready to create a new solution. This will be a Nastran linear static solution. We'll begin by dragging in our glue that we had defined earlier into our new solution as well as the load or actually we don't want any of the loads we'll just go for one of these constraints which specified a fixed constraint on those three faces we'll go ahead and bring that one in the other loads were from either the stress wizard or from design simulation which we no longer want because we're going to specify a new load an arrow load on the airfoil surfaces. But before we do that, we'll go ahead and create a symmetric constraint using a user-defined constraint fixing DOFs 2, 4, and 6 on the tangent continuous edges on the ends of our shell mesh. Now we're ready to specify our arrow loads as a pressure that we'll import from a field from an earlier computational fluid dynamics simulation, which was able to determine the pressure at the various locations on the airfoil. Here you can see the pressure can be specified in PSI or whatever pressure units you're comfortable with or that you have specified in the file that you'd like to import. So here is our CSV data that consists of XYZ pressure. You can see all of that data was imported. And we'd like to interpolate that data onto our new structural mesh, which does not mash, match our computational fluid dynamics mesh. So we'll select those airfoil faces. And then we can plot the contours of our pressure load on those faces. All right, next we'll specify uh, some more glue that will attach our shell mesh to our solid mesh. We'll do this with the manual method as opposed to the automatic that we had used earlier. We'll specify our source region and then our target region will be on the airfoil. And then a search distance. We have a little bit larger gap to span here, so we'll make sure we capture it. Then we'll do the same thing for the trailing airfoil and frame to connect them. And then we want to specify a connection between the trailing edge of the airfoil to itself because the trailing edge as you'll see in just a moment is not connected but is meshed on the outer faces of the airfoil. So once we edit the display size of these markers we'll be able to see that a little bit better. So here you can see that it's not connected on the bottom, but that glue will only connect those elements that are within two tenths of an inch as we specified for our search distance. So it will just capture the trailing edge and attach it to itself. All right, now we're ready to solve. And again, I'll pause the video. You can see the solve for this model takes uh, about the same amount of time, 37 seconds. and we'll review the results. Here we can see displacements.
I can animate those displacements. You can also take a look at stress. And here you'll uh, you'll notice we'll, we'll go ahead and put on the average stress first, but the stress is only shown for the parts that are not laminate, and we can see what the max. Uh, and minimum stress are if we turn on the markers. But if we want to take a look at the ply stresses, we need to go into the ply results. Here you can see we have ply results for every ply, XX, YY, ZZ, for ply 1, ply 2, same thing, XX, YY. And this could take us a while to try and determine where is our critical ply, what's our maximum stress. So to simplify this, we have laminate post reports that we can create. We'll go ahead and select our results that we'd like to include in our laminate post report. Then we'll specify what output we'd like to generate. Absolute max ply stresses, failure indices, strength ratio, margin of safety. You can specify any or all of those. And then generate our results file. So here you can see all of the ply results, plus at the bottom we can see our minimum margin of safety, which you can see is very healthy, our strength ratio, and this is across all plies. Here's our failure index and our max absolute stress. Here you can see XX, YY, now for XX, this is across all plies. Here, if you're wondering what is the critical ply, which one has the maximum stress, you can turn that on so it's displayed on top of each element. So you can see our max stress for XX and YY along with the critical ply. And that concludes the demonstration.